Okay, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you this evening to the first in this 2011 series of Our Changing World Lectures. I'm Gareth Lang, I'm head of the School of Biomedical Sciences. And, it's, and if I can tell you a little bit about this uh, lecture course, because uh, it is a lecture course, it's a, it's a course that is taken by first year students, and I think we've got about 40 of those in the audience today. Uh, this course was, is hosted by my school, uh, and we proposed this course just over 18 months ago now, I think. Uh, we, we proposed this course as really something uh, quite different from any existing undergraduate course. Uh, the un unusually, this is a truly multidisciplinary course. It spans all aspects of university life. And the overriding objective was to engage students at the university in thinking about the global challenges that confront our society, and especially to make them aware of the impact that science and academia can have in meeting these challenges. I think uh, the, in the, I'm just quoting here from the case that I remember making to the Senate when we proposed this course, said that we need to show that universities have a central role in enriching lives and in building a creative and enlightened society that can respond with invention and humanity to the challenges that face us and those still unseen. So last year was the first time that this course ran. And uh, the courses, these lectures, is, as you know, are being videoed. And those videos are available on YouTube, on iTunes U, and on the university website. I can tell you that the lectures from the last year's series have, have been downloaded more than 200,000 times. So this lecture course has received a remarkable audience. So it's uh, my pleasure today to introduce the, the, the two who's going to kick off this lecture series is uh, Dr. A uh, Andy Kerr. Now, Dr. Andy Kerr uh, was appointed in December last year to, as director of the Edinburgh Centre on Climate Change. He actually obtained his doctorate from the University of Edinburgh. In that, he was studying the stability of the Antarctic ice sheet, but he's moved a long way on from that. Andy Kerr really represents uh, very much the interface between academia and private in industry and the wider stakeholders. I mean, his role is very much to translate the impact of academic research into practical uh, achievements and new companies and building a carbon-free economy. So he's worked before coming to, uh, to be before being appointed as director of the Edinburgh Centre for Climate Change. He worked in the, in the private sector, in the emerging international carbon and biofuel markets with a variety of companies in different sectors, and it was heavily involved in public policy work, focusing on developing effective national and regional policy frameworks to support a, re a reduction in our dependence on fossil fuels and to support a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So, Andy, it's a pleasure to welcome you to give this inaugural lecture. Andy, thanks. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much indeed for the introduction. Uh, very good evening to you on this rather warm and muggy uh, September evening, which is not something you've been able to say in Edinburgh much in recent weeks. Um, what I'm going to do is just go through a series of topics really around energy security and climate change. And what I want to do is just get you thinking a little bit about some of the issues that we are going to be facing going forward, but also by thinking of where we've come from in the past. And so, although I've got a, a bunch of slides which is really aimed at the, at the students on this course, um, just so they've got, a, if you like, a, a, form, a formal uh, view of, of some of the comments that I'm making, I'm very happy to open this up at the end to a much wider discussion. I'm going to start with cars, automobiles. Um, I'm not much of a, a car person myself, um, but I had a little incident this summer where I was uh, out in France and I hired a car, not this one, um, but a, a rather modern Peugeot job. And uh, as, as is the case when you start driving in another country, you pick up the car and you're slightly tentatively driving out of the exit. And all of a sudden, just as we came out of the airport, because we'd flown in, um, I stalled the car. Yeah? 
Now, for those who are men in the audience, you'll appreciate there's something of a social contract where we have to be seen to be competent when we're driving uh, motor vehicles. Or at least we have to have a certain self-deception um, that we are competent when driving motor vehicles. So when I stalled the car, obviously I was deeply embarrassed, and particularly with lots of people watching. So I was fiddling and faffing around, trying to work out what I'd done. And at one point I hit the accelerator. And of course I hadn't actually stalled the car, it just had a start-stop engine system in the car. And so I shot forward, you know, very nearly crashing into a rather irate Frenchman. Now, um, obviously what I did was pretend to be German and then drive off. Um, <laughs> but the point was that after, after getting over that with a glass of wine, I was thinking about the technology that goes into cars nowadays, because they are just astonishing. And that got me thinking to a story that I'd heard a lot when I was younger. And I grew up in the States, uh, the East Coast of the States, in the late 60s and early 70s. And this is a Plymouth GTX 1967 model. And one of the stories that I heard a lot when I was growing up was when tradesmen came to our flat, they would often leave the car running, the engine running, while they came in to do their job, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, before going out again. Now, can you imagine going somewhere and just leaving your engine running for half an hour? So it made you think about over 40 years, it was 40 years ago now, of the sort of change in the way in which we use energy. And it also got me thinking about, well, how much did it cost them to do that? So I looked up how much it cost in terms of gasoline in 1970. Any ideas? Yeah, throw out a few ideas. Dollars per gallon. 75 cents a gallon? Any, any raising or lowering on that? 60? It was 36 cents a gallon. Now that's a US gallon, 3.8 litres or thereabouts. So that means it was about nine and a half cents a litre, you know, which in modern, in, in English money, would be about six pence a litre. And that's when oil was at about two dollars a barrel, which is just when the North Sea resource was being developed off northeast coast of Scotland and England. So that just get me thinking, got me thinking about, if you look at how much we have come on and how much energy we use now, 1970, we used about 6 billion tonnes of oil equivalent. In 2008, we used about 12 billion tonnes of oil equivalent. We've doubled our energy consumption around the world in 40 years. So we're actually seeing a phenomenal change in the amount of energy we are using. So keep this in mind when we go through this presentation, because the whole notion of how far we have come and the changes that we have seen over the last 30, 40 years, and also when we project forward towards 2050, because that's 40 years up from now, as to where we will be then. So, what does this all reflect? Well, one thing it's worth flagging is that what it partially reflects is a phenomenal success story in terms of economic success, narrowly defined, GDP. And there's lots to say about how you define wealth. But what is very clear is that we had steady but slow growth, but after the Industrial Revolution, we had a rapid, rapid increase globally in wealth creation. And this then took a further step, particularly after the Second World War, when that great innovation machine of the US got going, through the next 30, 40 years. And we've seen a bit again over the last 10 years. So this has been created a huge success story. Lots of people have been brought out of poverty, or relative poverty. But it has created two fairly big issues, and those are the ones I want to talk about today. One is energy security. These are, and I'm not talking about some of the Western countries here, these are some of the regions around the world, East Asia and Pacific, Latin America, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on. This one in particular is worth looking at. Between 1986 and 1996, it added about 50% in energy use, you know, energy consumption, going up from about a billion tonnes of oil equivalent to about a billion and a half. In the last 10 years, or eight or nine years, it's gone up again another billion. So where's that energy coming from? Where are we achieving that sort of uh, energy content? And I'll come back to that in a moment. 
The second issue is around environmental sustainability, and I've got a few things to say about this, but this I thought is a useful diagram because it actually again shows carbon emissions from fossil fuels. And what we saw is after the Industrial Revolution, fossil fuels basically until 1900 were all about coal burning. They were all about creating energy for the Industrial Revolution. And it was only in about the 1930s that we started to see a growth in liquid fossil fuels, oil. So until then, coal had dominated. And that went through until the 1980s, when it overtook coal as the most important or the most heavily used fossil fuel. Gas has been gently rising since the 1950s. But what we've seen just most recently, in particular in the last 10 years, has been again a massive spurt in the use of coal. And that's primarily because of the economic development within East Asia, within China, within uh, Southeast Asia. So we're seeing some very, very rapid rises in the use of fossil fuels and a rapid rise in greenhouse gas emissions. This is carbon dioxide emissions, which is now at about 30 billion tonnes of CO2 per year. So it's been fairly relentless, certainly from 1950 onwards. So let me just talk of, uh, and make a few comments about energy security. If we start from where we are now, 2008, 2009, 2010, and look forward the next few years, it's a bit of a mugs game to know exactly how much energy we will use. But what we can say is that if things go as we would expect them to go, notwithstanding the odd financial crisis, energy demand tends to rise at about 1.5% per year. So that over the next 20 years or so, 25 years, we'll get another 40% growth in energy use. So we're going up from 12 billion tonnes of oil equivalent to over 16 billion tonnes of oil equivalent. Now, the vast majority of this growth in energy use comes from non-developed countries, non-OECD countries, what we traditionally would call developing countries, particularly in Asia. If we don't do anything about the types of energy sources we have, fossil fuel will remain at about 80% of the share of total energy use, because that's what it has done traditionally since the 1970s. If we see that type of growth, you'd expect liquid oil to remain the dominant fuel type. Now, this starts flagging up all sorts of issues. Is there peak oil? When does it take place? And so on. So just bear in mind, these are scenarios, not predictions. But the other thing that really rises rapidly is the demand for power. And demand for power is rising relentlessly. And at the moment, the only way to get the type of rate of increase in power generation means that many countries are burning coal. So we're seeing a very, very rapid rise in energy consumption, but also in greenhouse gas emissions. And this just gives it in a slightly different format. So this is 1980. 1970 was at about 6, 000, so 6 billion tonnes of oil equivalent. That, 2008, was about 12 billion. 2020, 2035, up to over 16 billion tonnes of oil equivalent. And again, you can see the type of breakdown. Coal has increased, certainly over the next few years. Oils have increased. Gas has increased substantially but also so has renewables. In other words, we are seeing a very rapid rise in renewable resources, but actually that's just barely keeping pace with the rapid rise in other energy sources. So that's assuming we don't do anything about the situation we're in. What happens if we just let that go, if we let that run? What are we actually going to see? Well, what we are aware of is that simply to deliver the energy demand that we are expecting from around the world will require huge investments by countries, by companies, by individuals. Mm -hmm. And the numbers typically are typically thought of as around about 26 trillion US dollars is required over the next few years to deliver the energy demands that are being expected by rising populations, wealthier populations. We also know that there are rising costs of oil recovery. If you look at this chart down here, this is Brent crude from 2004 to 2011. This has been the price rise 
jiggling around, this is at about 30, hit a peak of about 70, dropped to 50, up to 140, down to 40 and back up, and we're down just above 100 now. Now when I first started getting involved in public policy work, there were a series of, of papers trying to look at energy demand and emissions in the UK. And there's a quite a well-known one called EP68, Energy Paper 68, that looked forward in 1998, I think it was, that it was published, looked forward for the next 10 to 12 years. And it said, what's the emissions from, green, from greenhouse gases going to be in the UK? Now that will depend on energy demand. Energy demand will depend on, to one extent, on prices. So it had to set a series of assumptions about the price of fossil fuels going forward. It set a low price, because these were scenarios, it set a low price scenario at $10 a barrel for oil. Fair enough. It had been $10 for a while. What do you think it set as its high price for oil? This was just before 2000, looking ahead 10 years. Any thoughts? 50? Yeah, it was 20. So that was a, a reasonable projection by the UK government, very well informed projection, which suggested that actually oil would be somewhere around here between 10 and 20, maybe up to 30 for the next 10 years. And actually what we've seen is this type of price rise or volatility. In other words, in one level it simply tells you that actually energy price forecasting is a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. We're not very good at it. Yeah. Either high or low, we're not very good at it. But it does flag this wider issue that there are rising costs and they are becoming more volatile, partly because of um, speculation, partly because of the demand changes that are going on around the world. And we're expecting these types of volatile future prices to have some fairly major effects on poverty alleviation. If you look at things like fuel poverty, they are dramatically affected, say in this country, by changing electricity prices. And we've just seen a big hike of 15-20% electricity prices, gas prices, by most of the major, oil uh, ma major energy companies. In part to do with wholesale market prices, in part to do with a series of requirements that they have to deliver to the government. But we are starting to see tangible impacts on wealth creation, on poverty alleviation. We also need to be acutely aware that something like 95% of all our transport needs, and we do love to transport things, ourselves all around the world in particular, we love transport, we love going places. 95% of that relies on oil. We don't have, as yet, a good alternative. Much of our agricultural products also depends on oil. It's an oil-based system. So when we start looking at these sorts of price rises, you have to ask yourself, why aren't we trying to wean ourselves off oil? Why aren't we trying to move away from it? And of course we are, and I'll come on to those in a moment. The other big issue to flag are what might be called energy security concerns. This is shorthand for saying we don't actually own the energy sources that we need. We've been very lapsadaisical in the UK because for the last 30, 40 years, we've had North Sea gas and oil. We've made a bit of money, we've produced most of our energy needs internally. What's the big deal? Whereas now we're starting to see a massive drop-off in the amount of gas that's produced in the North Sea. We're seeing a massive drop-off in the amount of oil, and we're suddenly becoming much, much bigger importers of gas and oil in particular, and coal. And where are we getting the gas from? Well, LNG is a good way because there's a global market, but typically we've been reliant on Iran, on Algeria, on Russia, on Norway. Now Norway's fine, but to what extent politically would you argue that they're stable regions that you would want to rely on for 80% or 75% of your heating needs, which is what we have, and 60% of our electricity needs on importing gas from Russia, say? So the question then is, from a political perspective, we need to be careful about where we get our energy from. And this is certainly an issue that's growing in places like China, because they're expected to become the biggest spender, i.e. the biggest contributor, on imports of oil and gas by 2025. India is expected to overtake Japan as a, big, as a major importer of oil and gas in the next 10 years or so. So suddenly they become very sensitive to global energy prices. And those are what the energy prices are doing.
So it affects them in terms of wealth creation as much as it affects us. So there's some major issues going forward in terms of countries starting to say, well, actually, we don't want to be entirely reliant on this type of resource of energy. So we're going to start to do something a bit different. <coughs> what do I mean by environmental sustainability? Now, I, I'm... I'm I, I was sort of in two minds as to whether to put up the next couple of slides, but I thought I would anyway. Um, one is just to flag CO, carbon dioxide emissions. And this is just a little background to say, how do you get carbon dioxide emissions that are caused by humans in energy terms, not in land use terms, but in energy terms? And it's a function of how much technology, the type of technology you use, whether you use coal-fired power stations or gas-fired power stations. You know, one is double the emissions compared with another per unit of energy. The extent to which you're, you use energy. We typically use more energy as we get wealthier. And as a function of population. Now globally, population is rising, wealth is rising, energy consumption is rising. So what do you expect CO2 to be doing? Yeah, you know, last year we hit a, another record, 2010. So that's CO2 emissions. Now, why am I interested in CO2 emissions? And this is a, what I've called a little timeout. It's just a three-slide timeout. Why this creates a number of environmental risks. Uh, and I'll try and explain in, in two or three minutes what I mean by this. Let's just go back to what global climate actually is. Yeah. Global climate is simply the fact that there is more solar radiation coming in at the equator than at the poles. So the Earth is seeking to redistribute the energy between the equator and the poles. And if you look at the amount of energy coming in, there's a little bit comes in from heating from the ground, from volcanic eruptions, but actually about 5,000 times more important is the amount of energy that comes in from the sun. Now our orbit of the Earth around the sun changes all the time. The orbit changes, the amount of, of angle of our spin changes, the angle of the Earth on the orbit changes, this is changing and it has changed over thousands and millions of years. It's also affected by the fact that we're largely a liquid or a gaseous planet. And what this attempt at transferring heat from the, or energy from the equator to the poles does is set up a series of uh, types of uh, circulation patterns. So you get very familiar patterns. You get tropical rainforests from huge amounts of rainfall around the equators. You get dry areas just north and south of the equator, which is where you get the deserts. You get the westerlies, which for those who have only just arrived in Scotland will appreciate what they're about. Yeah. Westerly flows coming up through the North Atlantic and North Pacific or the South Atlantic. And polar easterlies. You get very formalised sets of circulation being created. That is weather. That's what we feel on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's affected by how much energy is going in, it's affected by year-to-year -year changes, decadal changes. It will always change, it always has changed. So 15, 16,000 years ago, if we were standing here, we'd have about a kilometre of ice over the top of us, you know, entirely naturally. So big changes take place entirely naturally. So what's the big deal with greenhouse gases? Well, actually, these are simply trace gases that affect the radiative properties of the atmosphere. How do we know this? Well, actually, nearly 200 years ago, uh, Joseph Fourier, a very famous French physicist who I haven't got up here, um, noted that planets with an atmosphere tended to be colder than planets without, sorry, tended to be warmer than planets without an atmosphere. A few years later, Tyndall, a very famous Irish physicist, discovered the properties of what we now know of carbon dioxide. And he discovered them in a lab, and you can recreate the experiment very easily. They allow through shortwave radiation, they absorb longwave radiation, or certain types of longwave radiation. And back in the 1890s, nearly 120 years ago, the Swedish physicist, Arrhenius, first calculated the effect on global temperatures. None of this is new. This is not a seriously contested subject. What is massively contested is what does the future hold? And that is a very, very big challenge. So the principle that gases that we emit are having some impact is barely contested in the science community. And I, I won't go through this in detail, but it's simply to say that there are lots of things that affect weather. There's lots of things that affect climate. One of the things that does affect climate 
is greenhouse gas emissions, the most important of which is water vapour, which we don't really affect. The most important thing that we affect is, is carbon dioxide, which is why I've talked a little bit about carbon dioxide. I'm happy to talk about this later after the talk, but it was just to give a, a little background as to one of the issues we have, which is that we have a very good understanding, as climatologists, of broadly how the system works. But if you try and force a complex system, like the global climate, it is very, very uncertain what the future holds. In other words, a lot of the computer models that are used to represent the climate system are very effective at helping us understand how that system works. They're very bad at telling us what will happen at a particular time and place in the future. Let me just give you one example on that. The, the UK government uh, funded some work to try and look at what would be the impact at a local level of climate change in the UK. And this is one of the examples that, uh, that, that came out of what are called the UKC, well, UKCP09, UK Climate Impacts Programme 09 scenarios. And what this did was well, they were probabilistic scenarios. They weren't saying we know what the future holds. They were saying, well, let's try and get some bounds of probability as to where it lies. <coughs> what this is saying is that on this end of the axis, this says that there's something like a 90% probability and it's a subjective probability, it's not an objective probability, it's subjective, it's a something we think, to the best of our knowledge, that it's actually going to be wetter than that. And if you look at what that is, that basically is around about 0-10% to drier, maybe a little bit drier in some parts of Scotland. In other words, it's a little bit drier than we are now. So they reckon there's a 90% chance of it being wetter than that. They also think it's about a 90% chance of it being drier than that. Well, that is about 30 to 50 percent, say, wetter than we are now. What's that telling you? Hmm? That's telling you we're pretty sure it will probably get wetter unless it gets a bit drier. Hmm? Yeah. And that's cutting edge, absolutely cutting edge stuff. Hmm? In other words, we need to be very careful when we're talking about climate, particularly around rainfall or precipitation, about what our understanding actually is and what it isn't, what we can say and what we can't say. So while we can say some very sensible things that, you know, we're sticking greenhouse gases up, it's creating more energy in the system, the world globally will warm, actually saying what impact will that have on our local environment, how will that impact society beyond that, becomes increasingly difficult to ascertain. And it's one of the challenges where there's a huge amount of scientific debate as to how much you can say going into that space. It's worth keeping that in mind. OK, let me just come back to what I was saying about environmental sustainability. We're sticking 30 billion tonnes of CO2 up into the atmosphere, and a bit more if you add in land use emissions. I think it's fair to say that if you argue at a global level that we broadly have an understanding of the climate system and you wanted to try and manage the risks associated with the future, not to know that we do know the future, we don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to manage those risks going forward, then you might say, well, we're going to try and minimise the, the, the chance of it being rising global mean temperatures, which is not something that any of us can actually perceive, you have to get that from the, from the data, of getting any more than a two degree rise. In other words, can we try and reduce emissions or manage emissions so we don't cause global mean temperatures to rise by more than two degrees above pre-industrial levels? That is essentially what the Copenhagen Accord, which was developed uh, back in 2009 in Copenhagen, sought to achieve. Now, what the Copenhagen Accord also does is just acknowledge that climate is a risk and how we manage it is very important. It also implies that if we want to try and avoid warming the planet by more than 2 degrees C, we can't be emitting more than about between 40 and 48 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent going forward by 2020. Well, we're actually at about 48, 49 billion now. And if you added everything that we could do, you'd just about get down to 48 billion tonnes. In other words, if all the countries that signed up for something at Copenhagen 
they all did exactly what they said they were going to do and they achieved it to 100% and in no previous environmental treaty has that ever happened but if they were to do that you'd get emissions down to about 48 billion which is right at the top end of where we need to be. In other words I think it's probably fair to say that if you define environmental sustainability like that it's pretty unlikely we're going to hit it. And if we think a bit further forward what the Copenhagen Accord would do is essentially just level off our emissions at this level at around about 50. Yeah. After 2020 we'd then have to start thinking about how you're actually going to bring it down dramatically to 20 to 24 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent <coughs> per year. If we're going to achieve that down here, yeah, that requires, if we're guessing that there's going to be 7, 8 billion people on the planet by 2050, that requires us to have a per capita emissions of about two to two and a half tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per person. Mm. Now how are we going to achieve that? It's all very well for the developing nations to develop, that's fair enough, they need a lot of wealth creation. Developed nations actually aren't the ones who are emitting greenhouse gases in the same, or at least the, the rate of increase is not the same. They've been carrying on as they have. Most of the increase in greenhouse gas has been coming from non-OECD countries. So we have a challenge because the Copenhagen Accord is largely about managing emissions from this lot, developed countries. It's not about managing emissions from developing countries. So if you've got an accord that is managing emissions from one group that is basically flatlining anyway, and you're not managing emissions from another that is shooting up, you might say you've got a bit of a problem. But of course that doesn't reflect what might be called issues of equity. Because if you look at in terms of tonnes of CO2 equivalent per person, then you find the Australias, the Canadas, the US's, and then things like the Brazil, Indonesia's as well because of the land use emissions from deforestation are up at this end, whereas many of the other countries that we might think about are further down here. Having said that, yeah. Well, I said if we're trying to achieve in 2050 this nominal term environmental sustainability as defined by a two degree rise, see where China is now. China is emitting at about five, it's probably about six or seven now, tons of CO2 per person. I said that for this to meet those sustainability targets, it would need to be down at about two and a half tons of CO2 per person. In other words, China as well would have to halve its carbon intensity, halve its per capita emissions to hit those sorts of targets. So on the one hand, within a country like China, which is rapidly developing, where there's massive energy demand, there's also a major challenge, which it's fair to say that they recognise as well. So the proposition I really want to, to offer to you is that Regardless of what you think about climate change, if you are worried about energy, energy security in its broadest sense, energy resource constraints, or you are worried about climate issues and the risks associated with climate change, you'd have to say that a low carbon future is a necessary condition to delivering either of those, you know, a secure energy future or a secure environmental future. So I think it's it's difficult, particularly when you're thinking about consequent impacts on equity, on health, on wealth and so on, not to go down the route of saying, well actually, it just makes sense as a society, as a business, as a government, to follow through on this basic proposition. And what we're finding increasingly around the world is that that is exactly what is happening. <coughs> if you looked last year, at who was investing in green, clean technology, i.e. non-emitting or low-emitting technologies, you'd find that about $240 billion worth of investment took place last year. Mm. It's a lot of money going into clean technology development or green technology development. The biggest proportion was in China. So we're seeing massive investments going in in many parts of the world on this basis, not as some, you know, just to be nice to the environment, but actually because there's a very hard business case now to say, 
if we're going to manage the risks of climate change, if we're going to manage the risks of energy resource scarcities that are coming, and we're going to take some market opportunities, then we need to go down that route. And many countries are now developing that. So what I want to do now <clears throat> is just bring it all the way down just to a local level, rather than just do uh, very arm-waving things at a global level, and just explain where Scotland is going, because Scotland provides quite an interesting exemplar in this situation. Scotland, in 1990, was a tiny little player on the global scene, uh, and is even smaller now. It emitted net emissions of about 70 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. The UK as a whole, which emitted something near 700 million, was about 1.5% of global emissions. Yeah, so we're a tenth of that, so 0.1% of global emissions. These emissions have generally worked their way down, uh, caused as much by companies moving out as by uh, positive environmental policies. But there's now a sharp decrease required to hit some of these targets that are going forward because unanimously within the Parliament, they passed the Scottish Climate Change Act, which required binding targets through on an annual basis through until 2020 and then on to 2050. And they've just been in the process of setting these targets for the mid-20s at the moment. Now, these are incredibly ambitious targets, but there is a genuine perception, both within the political parties and within businesses, and I have to say in many communities, that this can be delivered at a benefit to society. In other words, there is less of an issue between saying this is an economic cost or it's an environmental benefit. In other words, it's not economy versus environment. Increasingly, we're starting to see people appreciate that actually the two can be joined together, that there are net benefits in social, economic, and environmental terms. Where do these emissions come from? Well, this was 2009. So we started, these are net emissions, we started 20-odd 20, uh, 20 years ago at 70-odd million tonnes. We're now down at 51 million tonnes. About a third comes from energy supply. It's electricity production and so on. A fifth from transport, a tenth from residential, quite a big chunk from agriculture and forestry. And then bits and pieces from others. So that's the sort of breakdown we've got. Now one of the challenges, I think, for policymakers, for governments, is to how can we take this step forward? How can we take the next step? If we're worried about energy security, what do we need to do? We need to stop being quite so reliant on fossil fuels. We need to be less reliant on imports. We need to develop nascent, homegrown industries. And this is what they've tried to do in Scotland. And this is the historical electricity generation in Scotland, which was heavily based on nuclear, coal, and gas, with a little bit of oil and a little bit of hydro. So about 10% hydro. And that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years and previously, since the hydro was developed 20, 30, 40 years ago. Where are we going now with this? This is what we're starting to see happen. And we are starting to see really quite radical changes take place, partly because you've got business buy-in, partly because you've got strong government drivers and support, and partly because you have an investment arena which allows us to take these opportunities. And so what we're seeing are dramatic increases in the installed capacity and the amount of renewables that exist. What does this mean in practice? This means in practice that this year we'll be producing about 30% of our electricity demand from renewables, up from about 10% 10 years ago. In other words, it's a very, very rapid rise. So it's just to demonstrate that this type of very, very rapid change is perfectly feasible if you get the things right. And there's a big conference going on in the uh, in Edinburgh International Conference Centre today and tomorrow which is all about creating the investment arena to allow investment into things like renewables. What are the broader energy intentions? Well, one of the big ones is about trying to reduce final energy demand. In other words, use energy more efficiently, more effectively. Another one which has come out this year is trying to create 100% of electricity demand from renewables within the next nine years. 
And actually, that doesn't mean that all electricity production will be renewable in Scotland. That means the demand requirements of the Scottish population will not be met by renewables. Anything else on top can be sold south. Yeah. Now, most people in industry think that's actually a perfectly feasible achievement, mm. that we should be able to get to that. In other words, within 20 years of starting the attempt to try and rejig our energy system, we could be in a position where 100% of our demand requirements within Scotland are met purely from renewable electricity. So we're seeing a phenomenal change taking place right now. Some to do with wind, some to do with hydro, some to do with biomass, biofuel, and so on. There's a whole range of different technologies. There's also a desire to see over 10% of heat demand come from renewables. This is important because actually in practice, although lots of people talk about electricity, only about a quarter of our total energy requirements come from electricity. Nearly half comes from heating water and heating space, space heating and water heating in homes and businesses. And the rest comes from transport. So actually there's a huge opportunity here in terms of improving welfare, improving quality of lives, in terms of actually just reducing the need for so much heat by improving the quality of the buildings and the built environment. <coughs> there's also a strong expectation of much more community and locally owned renewables. So they're expecting something like 500 megawatts of capacity owned actually by communities, for communities. And no new thermal power stations without carbon capture and storage. And that's something that you'll be hearing about uh, in the next week or so when Stuart Hazeldean comes to give his talk on carbon capture and storage. So there is an aim within the Scottish Government to try and ensure that 30% of total energy demand comes from renewables within the next 10 years. Will they meet that one? Well, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. But they're going to be pretty close to it if all goes well. Which brings me back to this old car, the Plymouth GTX 67 model. If you think about where we have come from since 1967, 1970, when this was being driven around the roads of the States, through to the sort of cars that are now available with the latest stop-start technologies and so on, and then think forward about where we're going, one thing that comes out is the sheer level of change that has taken place. And one of the key bits of change that's taken place is this translation between what might be termed just dumb energy use and information technology. And it's something I, I say to a lot of people, which is that you know, in the last 40 years, we've tended to have and treat energy as a very cheap resource. And information has typically been very expensive. For the next 20 or 30 years, information is becoming incredibly cheap. And energy is becoming extremely expensive. And we haven't actually rejigged our whole energy system to deliver on that. So, for example, who here and has, has a fridge? Yeah. Has everyone got a fridge? Yeah. Are they all A-rated fridges? Maybe not got an A-rated fridge that they use for their food. Mm. Yeah. A couple of people sticking up their hands very quietly. Does anybody have a drinks fridge? Hmm? A few people. Drinks fridges, yeah. Are they an old, tatty little fridge stuck around the back? Or is it also an A-rated fridge? Very good. If you talk to a lot of particularly families, yeah, they'll often have a fancy fridge in the kitchen, and then out in the garage, they'll have a little drinks fridge, hmm? which is about a D-rate or an E-rated one. Yeah. And that is on all the time for the sake of half an hour or one hour of chilling required per day to cool something that is not perishable when you need it. Now, why aren't we using information technology, you know, a smartphone or something that allows us to turn that on and off when we require? Or even better, if you've got heating in a home which is set manually or comes on automatically at a particular time, why not just get it to come on when you come within 100 metres or 200 metres of your home? It's all perfectly feasible. There's nothing, you know, you can put an app on a smartphone, it'll deliver it for it, you can do it. And yet we're still using energy in this unbelievably dumb way that these people were using in cars, and the energy use in cars, 40 years ago. In other words, there are lots of things that can be done which don't require trillions of dollars of investment, billions of euros of investment, which is simply about using energy much more smartly. But 
There is a challenge, and one of the challenges is we keep on talking about energy as being really important for people. But if you actually look at how much people spend on energy and how much they spend on other things in their lives, what you tend to find is that energy use actually is pretty small, 4 or 5% of the household budget. A lot of the time, not, not for everyone, there are real fuel poverty issues, but, not, but for many people it's of that sort of order of magnitude. You find that people spend the same sort of amount on toiletries and perfumes. So when you say energy is vitally important, you just have to be a little careful because actually people are spending just as much on perfumes and toiletries as they are on energy. But energy use is critical going forward and there's a real opportunity for managing risks with that. The final point I want to make um, this evening is just to flag that one of the challenges that we have had over the last few years and will have going forward is that we are talking about really rapid changes in both technology, in social innovation, in policy. We're often getting policies and political frameworks, regulatory frameworks, far in advance of good if you like, social science or science understanding of what the impact of that is. So we're seeing very, very radical changes going forward. Universities, I would have thought, ought to be at the forefront of this radical innovation that is going on in the energy sphere, in the climate change sphere. Because they do lots of good research, they do knowledge exchange, they do teaching and learning. But what we tend to find in universities, and certainly my, my experience of universities, has been actually they're very poorly structured to deliver on this type of event, on this type of activity. Because what you actually find is people love their particular disciplines. You know, they live in little silos. You know, they love being in geosciences or law. Or, you know. And actually these are the sorts of problems that actually require people to come together from all the different disciplines. This was just a quote from a, 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 this is a workshop I attended last year, and they were still asking this type of question, which I found utterly unbelievable. Is there scope for interdisciplinary approaches to, to, uh, to, to meet the challenges of climate change? How could you not meet the challenges of climate change without embracing many of the different learnings that we have from different disciplines? We also have an institutional problem. We love thinking that we're the best. And actually, often the knowledge doesn't reside in universities. It'll often reside in, you know, in banks or in consultancy companies or in engineering companies or in other companies. And it doesn't necessarily reside just here and now. And actually, we're still very bad at pulling together this type of knowledge that's required to deliver against these types of changes. And we still tend to talk about knowledge transfer as if we are the great gods holding up that knowledge and then passing it out to people rather than understanding that actually to solve some of these big, complex, challenging problems, we actually need to bring people together. You know? We can't solve some of these problems without getting local authorities involved. They're a delivery agent, or working with local companies, or lo working with local communities. So we have a real challenge in terms of just how we manage this process. So I'll just leave you with that, just in terms of going forward, some of the big challenges has been how do you encourage cross-fertilisation of ideas, cross-discipline learning. And this is a very good example of, of, a, of a lecture series which is trying to bring people together at some of the real challenges from very many different walks of life. Uh, so I, I commend it to you. And I'll just finish by saying that that's exactly what we're trying to do in our centre, which is actually all about trying to bring together businesses, governments, communities around finding ways of solving some of these big challenges. And I'll stop there. Thank you. I think you've made it very clear that there aren't any uh, easy answers and there are, are lots of challenges that will require a great wide range of approaches from different disciplines and determination, political determination of years. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, lots of food for thought here. Who wants to start? Okay, so you were showing us that even a, a country like Scotland that um, seemed to have quite a steady um, energy consumption, it wasn't, it was spiking a little bit, but it wasn't much, especially compared to other countries, um, that even then the targets for the energy consumption are fairly unrealistic. Do you actually think that we are going to make a difference with this and that in um, 10, 20 years we'll have actually 
be anywhere close to these targets? Is it worth doing? Well, that's not really what I'm asking. I'm asking, is it actually going to make a difference, do you think? Well, uh, I, um, I think the, answer, the way I'd answer that is to say that I don't think, given some of the equity issues that we've seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years within big international forums like the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework <laughs> Convention on Climate Change, that we will ever get to a point, at least not in the next 10 or 15 years, where you will get states being able to agree a common solution where you're trying to get all 190-something states to agree to that particular outcome. I just don't believe that's feasible anymore. What I'm expecting to see is much more in the way of bilateral agreements between certain countries. And in particular, one of the reasons for trying to bring out the issue with Scotland at the moment is that what we are seeing around the world are some fantastic exemplars from different regions, whether it's you know, some of the states in Australia, some of the states in the US, some of the city regions in China, some of the, you know, the, the, some of the city regions in India, where you're starting to get, if you like, um, fantastic energy in the sense of activity towards delivering a positive vision of the future, which is to deliver the energy needs that we want as a society, but at a lower carbon intensity. And so I think there are, in some ways, more productive opportunities going forward by getting these regions that are driving forward this agenda together as a way of demonstrating what can be achieved, rather than trying to expect you know, something that happens at negotiations that happen in Durban to come up with something that satisfies <laughs> everyone from China, you know, population one point something billion, and you know, the island of, of I don't know, Tuvalu or something like that, population a few thousand. That is just very, very tricky. And I think we've got to the point where it's far better to demonstrate to people that actually you can have a thriving modern economy delivering the energy needs of the population without emitting and without being reliant on imported fossil fuels. I just don't understand how you, like, you, you're saying that you can meet our energy needs for modern um, society, but how can we do that and, and still emit little carbon dioxide? Because like, we have, you, as you say, mini fridges. No one actually needs a mini fridge. Like, you don't need that. And if you compare our energy consumption today to like before the usage, the the um, industrial revolution, like we need we need our carbon um, carbon emissions to go to to that level, but we can't do that because technology has developed so much, and people rely on smartphones. We don't need smartphones, so I don't like understand how. To me, it seems like it's an academic problem as opposed to people just modelling it, but I don't see how we're actually going to apply it and actually make a difference. We've been discussing it for so long, I just don't understand how in this modern day and age, when everyone's so reliant on all these little gadgets, which themselves consume energy, this whole lecture itself is emitting a carbon dioxide. It's so warm in this room, I just don't understand. I don't see it as a problem that we're going to solve. Like, I don't, yeah. But just, I mean, just what, what I was trying to share with Scotland is we're actually on a track which, for example, will deliver, you know, let, let's say we get to 90% of our energy electricity needs from renewables, yeah, in 2020, yeah, which is perfectly feasible at the rate we're, we're growing them at the moment. Now, that means that all the electricity we use within Scotland, not strictly, but all the electricity we use in Scotland doesn't have emissions attached to them, or very minimal, or at least they're only supply side from embedded carbon within the supply chain. Yeah, so essentially, we've then reduced our emissions from electricity to near zero. Now, if we start to see, as we are expecting to see, say, a lot of electric cars coming in, so actually your transport needs are met largely through electric or maybe through fuel cells and hydrogen, off the back of renewable electricity generation, then actually you're generating all the energy needs you've got, you need, but you're not emitting greenhouse gases. So there are very practical pathways that we're actually on the way towards now. I mean, and that's what I was trying to flag, is that 10 years ago, you know, everyone looked around in, in Scotland or in the UK and said, well, we can't really do a huge amount because it's all, it's all too big. But actually now, we're, 10 years later, we've now up to 30% of our electricity needs are from renewables. You know, another uh, two or three years, it's going to be up to 50%. Now, that means that half all the electricity we use has no greenhouse gas emissions attached to it. So we're starting to go down a very rapid decarbonisation route right now in Scotland. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, that is very radical. Uh, so I, I think it is possible. <laughs>
Uh, surely the, the idea that hydrogen is carbon-free is not true. You have to make an enormous amount of energy to make hydrogen. Yeah, it That's depends. the first point. Yeah. And the second mm. point is if we wanted really to make our uh, energy carbon-free, we'd buy it from France, which mm. make 90% of their electricity comes from nuclear power. Yeah. Well, two things on that. First of all, hydrogen is, a, is like a battery. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to make it from something. And if you make it from renewable electricity, it's got no embedded carbon. If you make it from coal, it's got lots of embedded carbon. Absolutely. Um, in terms of why don't we just buy it from France, well, the answer is we operate in a GB grid. Yeah, there are lots of nuclear power stations which aren't going to go away on that GB grid. Um, so the issue is, you know, and it's a, it's a single grid. It's not a, it's not a Scottish grid and an English grid. So actually we're part of a broader grid with nuclear and coal and gas and biomass and a whole range of other things. So what we're saying here is, what does Scotland have to offer here? And actually what we have to offer is fantastic R&D capability, we've got fantastic resource capacity, and we've got a belief that actually there's economic benefit in developing a market in this space to sell elsewhere. So actually from our perspective there's economic benefit and to develop the renewable resource Mm. which we can then sell elsewhere. That's, that's if you like, the, the, the benefit to Scotland, a byproduct of which is that we happen to end up with a very low carbon intensity grid. Now, is nuclear required going forward? I think it is, yeah, I, I, I think it is. I think it's unbelievably expensive because they're uninsurable and therefore we as individuals always have to pick up the tab through the government. Yeah? And that's always a hidden cost which is never seen until an event happens. So I, I think there are issues but if we're going forward in the UK and we want to decarbonise our electricity supply, it has to be either renewables or fossil fuels with carbon capture or nuclear. And, and those are the, the approaches going forward. What I was saying was, was Scotland alone because we actually have a particular uh, strength that I think we should uh, deliver against. But I fully take your point about nuclear. Thank you. I thought it was really interesting. I was just wondering um, what you feel the implications of the new kind of local carbon-free economies might be on the extremely poor developing countries? Um, I, I think there's a, I think where there is a, well, I, 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 it rather depends on which particular ones you're talking about. The, the answer is, at the moment, renewable technologies typically are more expensive than non-renewable technologies. So therefore, if you're saying energy needs of that community is more important, then they're going to go down a non-renewable route. Having said that, I mean, the most recent uh, tender of electricity, for example, in, in, um, in Brazil, um, actually the lowest tenderers for delivering the electricity was actually onshore wind. It wasn't uh, rather than coal, oddly enough, or sorry, rather than gas. So we're getting technologies down to be cost comparable, but typically they are costing more. And therefore, if you have an energy cost, and that will then affect the, either the wealth creation or poverty alleviation, then there will be a tangible impact. And the question will be, for each particular region that you are talking about, what's the trade-off for that particular region? Uh, and that's a, a, it's difficult to talk in theory about that. It rather depends on a particular region. Um, I know that the EU and the US are committing a lot of subsidies for the production of biofuels and how that's a real problem in terms of it's quite carbon-intensive agriculture in most places and it also takes up land for food production. So just wondering if you could comment on that and how you think it might develop over the next few years. Yeah, I think the, well, it's worth distinguishing biofuel and biomass in the sense that biofuel, first generation biofuels were competing against agricultural produce. That creates all sorts of um, uh, unintended consequences, particularly in the food system. Um, so there is a real problem. I think the EU has now recognized that um, and is now trying to step back a bit from the stance it took a few years ago. Um, I think the US have still got themselves into all sorts of problems with its corn subsidies around that space, um, and there's a bit of work that needs to be done. I think there is a lot of very productive work in universities here in Asia, in the US, in South America, looking at second, third generation biofuels which are not competing against food crops. Uh, and there is some really interesting stuff on that around algae and, and various other things. Um, on, the, on the issue of biomass, biomass has certain advantages, particularly you know, either by replacing other things like using wood rather than concrete, or it can be burnt for heat, or it can be burnt for electricity. 
Um, there are some odd issues with the subsidies, particularly in the UK, around burning biomass for electricity, because you may well screw up other industries by doing it, um, particularly the wood panelling industry and things like that. But there are better uses of that in creating heat or in creating uh, embedded low, low carbon embedded products going forward. And thank you very much for your presentation. Um, can I just quickly argue something through with you and ask for your comments? I think you said at the beginning that climate change, there was scientific consensus, almost 100%, that it's anthropogenic. I, well, I didn't actually, I didn't use those words, but you carry on. I'll, I'll say what I did say. Well, man-made, <laughs> as a result of man's activities. We, I, I think there is a, uh, I think there is clear evidence that our fingerprints are over some of the changes that we have seen in the last 40, 50 years, yes. Um, you know, climate change has always taken place regardless of whether we've been involved or not, and it will always will regardless of whether we have been involved. I think we are starting to see our signature on it, and we have seen it over the last 40 or 50 years. And I, I, yes, I would, I would say that the data support that, yeah. Right. Um, and I know it's not a very easy relationship, but it is, of course, in some way related to the size of the human population. It is. Uh, which is increasing by about 75 million a year. Yeah. We are going to hit 7 billion this year, yeah. end of October. Um, I see that part of your remit for your functions is skills and education and interacting with the public sector and the decision makers in society. I just wonder whether you feel that as a result of this really, really frightening stuff that you're presenting. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen if we go above 2%. You haven't really painted that scenario. But um, are you in a position to comment at all on population issues? Because I see this as being a core part yeah. of this. It, I mean, it's, it's an elephant in the room. And the answer is there is actually a whole lecture going to be on population, which I shall be very interested to see. I mean, the answer is I, I showed the slide of you know, what makes greenhouse gas emissions from, or carbon dioxide emissions from humans, one of which is it's, it's a function of population, and clearly that has a big effect. Um, do we have a, a role or a remit within our centre to try and manage that? No, not really. Um, by choice, we're not doing that, but I think it's a really big issue, yeah. yeah. And, and there's a... There's a Can I just follow up then? And ask, ask you who in this university, for instance, is doing it? Well, the, could you say who's the... Is it Aubrey, is it? Aubrey yeah, Aubrey Manning is giving a full lecture on exactly this issue later in this course. So. Okay. I mean, the, the answer is there is, th th there is quite a lot of work, particularly in, well, actually in, in um, I, I can't name an individual in this university. There is a lot of work in universities around particularly the use of education, female education, in developing countries as a way of reducing um, numbers of children to individuals, yeah, because you tend to find if you have a highly educated female population, childbirth rates go down. So there is a lot of work on that in the social sciences generally, but I couldn't, I don't have a, a name off the top of my head who's doing that. Um, but you can find it, you can look up those, those that sort of information. Uh, I, I found this quite idealistic actually, um, in a sense that it, it doesn't deal with the immediate situation that we're facing in developing countries. Um, you know, it's all very well, we're very complacent that we, in Scotland we're going to um, achieve these goals, but it's done in isolation. What is the effect? What, what, what mitigation action can the world take or can governments take to um, ameliorate the, 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 the severe problems of climate change which are really affecting East Africa, uh, drought, um, water shortages, um, th these seem to be global disasters which are occurring while we are steadily uh, achieving our goals. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two separate issues and, and, and they need to be tied more closely together. I've been talking about how you reduce reliance on fossil fuels. There's a flip side, which is that we need to build up resilience within our societies to environmental changes or climate shocks or whatever, however you want to describe it. We've seen a lot of those um, recently. Some will be natural, some will be human-induced, I think, or at least we've got a signature on it. What is clear is that many populations are not well set 
to manage the sure shock that's coming, whether it's the, the fires that we saw in Russia last year or the flooding in Pakistan last year. Um, so one of the questions has to be for many of these governments, how can we ensure that there is much better learning around the world from different societies about what works and what doesn't to ameliorate some of those impacts? Uh, and, and quite frankly, it doesn't really matter whether this is human-induced climate change or just climate change or whether it's because we've got bigger populations living in more areas that wouldn't, you know, weren't previously populated. It really doesn't matter. The fact is more people are being affected by environmental events at the moment. And the question is, how do we manage that going forward? And we don't yet have very effective tools and techniques as societies for managing this type of shock event that's occurring around the world. And it's something that a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, and I, I don't have a, an easy pat answer for you, except to say that you know, we ought to be able to plan and prepare communities in different parts of the world much more effectively to potential impacts that come in that might be, might be about to happen. Um, and we've been very, very poor at that, and that's something that we need to remedy. Um, you mentioned uh, using fossil fuels of carbon capture technology. I just wondered how viable you think that is as either uh, part of the solution or as a solution in itself, seeing as it just enables further use of what is ultimately a finite resource. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I, I think um, there's going to be a whole lecture on it, so I, I don't want to start spending too long on it. What, what I would say about carbon capture is that it is clear that there are a fair number of countries around the world who have got a lot of sunk costs into existing fossil fuel technologies and they are not going to shut them down. So they are going to be burning fossil fuels in that for a fair old time to come. So one of the questions is how do you manage that going forward? How do you develop that and manage that going forward? And clearly carbon capture is one possible technique for doing it. At the moment it is untested at full scale models um, and although it works at small scale we don't know whether it works cost effectively. We do know it creates a massive hit on power station efficiency. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to do it. So there are all sorts of problems, not least the cost, but actually what we need is a series of pilot plants to see what it is and whether it is viable. I think you, know, you can't do that in theory. I think you've actually got to try it with hard engineering to see whether it works. And if it doesn't work, fine. Concentrate on other things, which is renewables or nuclear. If it does work, great. You know. So I, I think that's where I'll leave it on it. Hi, thank you for the presentation. And I see in your slide that uh, the Scotland is setting a target right now. And I know China is now setting a target. But without the, uh, the other superpower in this world, like the US, we know that US is quitting the Kyoto Protocol. And in the Boeing Conference, Japan and Russia all, all want to quit that. So post Kyoto Protocol period, how do you think that we can create a kind of international cooperation? Uh, and without international cooperation, will these countries like Scotland or like China, they will continue to do this? Because, it, because at, at least, you know, trying to reduce the kind of GHG is kind of costing. They're going to have a kind of a raise here and the financial budget like that. How, do you, we got, how can we go on for this international cooperation? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I, the, I mean, the US and China between them produce 40% of global emissions. You know, if you're going to have a state-based negotiation, those two have to be in it. Um, the top 10 emitters, including, you know, Russia, Iran, UK, uh, India, and so on, is, what, 60 70%. So th there are a few small players who play a massive role. Um, but what we've seen is almost 20 years of failure at international negotiation levels. And so my personal take is that we're much more likely to see bilateral agreements, say, between the EU and China or the EU and Japan, um, rather than um, a, a whole all-encompassing policy framework that everyone agrees to. There is a real issue with the US at the moment. There is just such political, there are such political loggerheads over so many things in which the environment has become a political football um, that, that I think there's real challenge going forward for anyone dealing with that in that space. And I think the better way is to try and demonstrate uh, and, and what we're certainly seeing in terms of investments into new markets and clean technology markets is that it's Asia, it's Europe, you know, South America is starting to get in on the act. The thing that's missing in that at a, at a large scale level is, is, is the US. So I think there are some challenges. Having said that, at state-based level, there are some very interesting things going on. So I think it's more a matter of 
honing in on particular areas where a lot is going on rather than trying to take it at a national level because that's a or a federal level because that's just nothing. Okay, going. I think this will have to be the last question now. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question will be, it may seem a little bit naive or but um, how can we fully introduce renewables when um, economic, industrial economic is in fully growth and more uh, pol politics are getting involved and um, for example, if you want to introduce the um, uh, solar car, so the carbon will get lower, you will um, interfere with the car uh, economy and so on. And s there are a lot of more examples. Um, how can we actually, I don't know, for 90% introduce at least renewables in that way and not interfere with politics or with more bigger powers? Because. I, I think the answer is you, you've actually got, I mean, what we tend to find is the politicians want to have somebody else leading. Yeah? So what we are finding is that you do need groups of stakeholders, whether it's civil society or businesses, working alongside governments to say, actually, these things are possible. You know, it was very striking that when the Climate Change Scotland Act was passed in the Parliament the week before, there was a jointly signed letter between one of the big climate um, sort of action group, Stop Climate Chaos, and Ian Marchant, who's the chief executive of the biggest Scottish listed company, the biggest the Scottish energy company, where they both said, we can do this. You know? Now that gives the politicians a lot of political cover. You know? And if you talk to Ian Marchant about it, he would say, there are three things here. Resource efficiency, you know? risks of climate change, and market opportunities. You know? And he said, if you take those three, it makes hard-nosed business sense to be getting into these spaces and into these areas. So what we can't expect is politicians running out and saying, we need to save the world. What you need is a whole group of people from communities, businesses, saying, actually, there's an opportunity here. You know, we need to take it. And that actually gives a lot more, as a much more effective way of, of generating change, I think, um, than we've seen from trying to get this, this sort of national, international framework, which nobody takes very seriously. Well, thanks very much. You've clearly uh, triggered an awful lot of thought in, in the audience, and I'm quite sure that, comes, uh, that questions would carry on for another half hour if I let them. You've given, I think, a very positive, optimistic picture, as well as a kind of warning message, and I really like that to kick off this series. I mean, you've shown that, in fact, there are potential solutions, there are ways forward. It'll be difficult, but, you know, with... Uh, wit and intelligence and investment and uh, uh, the application of science and the engagement of politics and the engagement of the broader community, then in fact we, we can make a big difference. Yep. So thank you very much and on behalf of all of us, thank you. And thank you all, all of you for who have contributed to the questions and, and thank you. Uh, and I hope to see you here again next week and for the rest of the lectures. Thank you. <laughs>